I just kind of feel like flowing this morning. I know some of y'all are worried about the offering right now and the announcements, but I'm not. I just kind of feel like doing what God wants us to do today. Can we do that? Can we just, can we just everybody close your eyes in this room and let's just get sensitive to the Holy Ghost for a moment. Can we, can we do that? I don't, I don't think God wants us to push our agenda today. I think God wants to push his agenda this morning. God, let your glory rise in this house today. Let your anointing, let your freedom, let your presence arise in this place right here this morning. God, let healing arise. Let let freedom arise, Lord Jesus. We give our hearts to you this morning, God. I don't have um, a sermon to preach this morning. I did not give the media team any scriptures, uh, any notes to put up on the screen. Um, I just want to, I want to talk to you for a few minutes today and just kind of tell you where my heart is this morning. I believe that God is absolutely crazy and in love with worship. And I think we need to, as the body of Christ and as the church and as believers and saints, we need to have a better understanding of that. How much God enjoys worship and how much God gets absolutely nothing out of you when you come in and just sit on a pew and play patty cake and go through the motions. I believe that we, we, we are in an urgent time in America right now, and this is no time for us to be coming to church to see what each other's got on and uh, to play games with God. I believe that when we come into this place on Sunday mornings, there is a switch that needs to go off a switch to the outside world. You don't need to be thinking about where you're going to eat after service right now. You don't need to be thinking about your job or your kids or, or where you're going to go this evening. When you come into this place on Sunday morning, you need to bring your mind in here. If you want the man that stands behind this pulpit to be anointed, if you want this worship team to be anointed as they're worshiping, you need to bring your mind in here. And I believe that God wants us to know this morning that worship is important to him and that it's important that we worship him like he wants us to worship him. I believe that there is great power and significance and importance to worshiping God the way he has instructed us to worship him. You remember that scripture where Jesus said, they that worship me, listen to the words here, must worship me in spirit and in truth. Do you understand what God's saying there? He's saying when you worship me, you got to do it a certain way. And when you worship me, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to worship me to your style of music or your, your favorite song. You've, you've got to worship me the way I want you to worship me. And God put something on my heart yesterday. Yesterday morning I was thinking about King Saul in the Old Testament. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, the Bible says, I want you to listen to this. I might not preach this morning. I might just talk to you. The Bible says that God spoke to Saul, king of Israel, and he said, I want you to go and I want you to smite Amalek. I want you to destroy, listen at the commandment of God. He said, I want you to destroy all that they have. Every, I know this sounds crazy, but this is what God said. He said, I want you to kill every man, woman, and child. I want you to kill the king of Amalek. I want you to kill all of the livestock. By the time you're finished in that city, I want it all gone. I want it all destroyed. And the Bible says that Saul goes into Amalek, and he kills all the men and women, but then... Saul got an idea in his brain. He said, I'm going to worship God like I want to worship him. And the Bible says that he spared the livestock. And he brought the livestock back to God. 
and he said, here, God, I want to offer you this, these animals as a sacrifice to you. I, I want to worship you. Even though God said, no, I want you to destroy all the livestock, Saul said, well, I want to worship you the way I want to worship you. And this, this is my gift to you. And the Bible says that God rejected Saul's worship because he tried to worship God his own way and God spoke to Saul, and he, he said that amazing verse that we can all quote, to obey my voice, to just listen to what I say and to do it is better than to sacrifice. You know, when you're obeying God, you, you, you're worshiping him, right? And, and you can't just worship God when your favorite song's playing. You can't just, when, when the beat on the drums is just right, and you want to get your shout and dance on then, but then when we're not singing your favorite music, you just want to sit there like a knot on a log. That's not worship. You got to worship God on his terms. You got to worship God the way he wants to be worshiped. And I thought about another example of, of Saul. And I hate to just pick on Saul this morning, but there's another example in the Old Testament of where the Bible says, listen to this, that the Israelites were at war with the Philistines. Scripture says that the Philistines had, had Israel outnumbered. And when the, the Israelites saw that there was no way they could win this fight, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 13 that they fled to the mountains and they hid behind caves, and they hid behind rocks, and they were scattered. And Scripture records that when King Saul, when he witnessed that his army was gone, that they were scattered, and that they were fixing to lose this battle, the Bible says that he offered, notice this, a burnt offering and a peace offering to God, offerings of worship. In other words, when Saul got in trouble and he didn't see any way out of his mess, he tried to worship his way out of his mess. I want to say this morning, I want to tell you what worship is not. Worship is not a beckon call to get yourself out of a mess that you yourself have created on your own. God is not going to honor something. God is not going to receive something where we've gone all week long without acknowledging God whatsoever in our life and then we come up here and we throw our hands up on Sunday morning and we expect his anointing and we expect his healing. We expect his freedom, his power to just show up in this place. God's not going to honor something that we give him just in hopes that he'll bless us in return. I feel like I see this in church a lot where there's people who, they never engage. They never go after God in worship as long as everything in their life is going good. A lot of people don't even come to church when everything in their life is just fine. But when crisis comes, they're in church and they're worshiping and they're praying. Why can't we pray with intensity on a consistent basis when everything's going great in our life? Why can't we worship God with zeal and with passion and with hunger when everything's just fine, not when things are going bad? Imagine if we treated our job like we treat church sometimes or like we treat worship. Imagine if you told your boss, your employer, I'm only going to show up for work when I run out of money. When I can't afford to pay my bills and when my bank account gets to zero, I'll come in and I'll work for a week and I'll get caught up on the bills and then I just won't show back up for a while. Imagine if we treated church that way. Your boss would fire you. You've got to show up for work every single day in the good times, in the bad times, in the high times, in the low times. Worship should be the exact same way. We should worship God with the same hunger, the same intensity all the time, but we don't. We can't seem to get this in our mind that God does inhabit the praises of his people and I'll never be closer to God's presence than when I am worshiping him. When I worship him, he comes to where I am. If we really believed that, we would be better worshipers, more consistent worshipers. We would worship him in the high and in the low times. Let me just, I feel like just pulling out these 
these Old Testament scenarios this morning. I, I was thinking about Moses and Aaron in the Old Testament. When they would go into the tabernacle of Israel, Aaron was the high priest. When he would go into the tabernacle of Israel, God's sanctuary, God's holy place, if you study Aaron, he would worship God with such reverence. Every time he walked into God's sanctuary, he would make sure that the sacrifice was just perfect that the incense on the altar was just right. He would make sure that after he offered the sacrifice, he would wash his hands in the laver because it was God's commandment concerning worship. And he made sure everything was perfect. And every time, it didn't matter how many times Aaron come in to the tabernacle of God, he entered every time with respect and humility and reverence and said, I am in the presence of God. I am in his sanctuary. And the Bible says there come a day where his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, who were not bad people, they were not sinful guys. They were not evil people. They just walked into the tabernacle one day and said, we do this all the time. This is monotonous. This is routine to us. This is just going through the motions. Hey, we like this incense all the time. Let's change it up. Let's like this kind instead. And the Bible says that God destroyed them. He consumed them with fire simply for one reason. They messed worship up. When they came into God's holy place, they didn't stand in awe of him. They didn't stand in awe of his presence. I want to ask you a question this morning, and I want you to, I want you to take this very seriously. When you come into this house, do you reverence God? When you walk into these doors on Sunday morning, do you acknowledge his presence when you come in here? When you walk into this place, do you stand in awe of the Lord? Or is it just casual, routine, go through the motions, sing a song, do a dance, and leave? Because the greatest challenge for you and for me and for the modern day Christian is not to allow anything in this life to rob us of our zeal and our hunger and our reverence and our respect for God. Every time I come into this place, I need to understand. I need to have the revelation. I'm not walking into my living room. I'm walking into the glory, into the power, into the sanctuary of the living God. And I ought to respect that a little bit. Because if you're not careful, you'll get to the point where you don't reverence him. You come to church and it's about you. It's about how you feel. If you're not careful, you won't feel that need to worship him. Have you ever gone a few days? Have you ever gone a few weeks? Maybe you got busy, busy on the job, busy with family, busy doing other things, and, and, and you kind of put God on, on the back burner. If you're comfortable with that, you're in a dangerous place, my friend. But if you're the kind of person where you go a few days and you kind of put God off to the side and it, it eats you alive. This past week, I am so tired of building a house, I cannot stand it. I'm ready to put my fist through a wall. If you've never built a house before, please don't. Don't do it. It's not worth it. No, I'm just kidding. But We've been building this house every out there in the mornings, out there till 10 o'clock at night, working, working, working. And this week, it's eat me alive because I'll confess to you, I've kind of I've put God on the back burner to get this house built, and I'm sick. I come to church this morning, and I'm unsatisfied. I'm like, God, I'm sorry. I want you to be first in my life. I want you to be supreme above all else, above, above my house, above my family, above my job. God, I I want you at the top. And that is what life is supposed to be like for the Christian. Where God is sovereign above anything else and everything else. I thought about, is this, is this making any sense? If I'm boring you, I'm sorry. But I'm not going to stop. 
I thought about the wise men. Look at their worship. The Bible says they traveled. They heard. They received the news. He's here. The one we've been waiting for, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, he is physically here. Can you imagine? And they traveled from India to Bethlehem on foot, a 3,000-mile journey. Let me put that in perspective. From North Carolina to California, the average distance is just about 2,200 miles. They traveled 3,000 miles on foot to get to the place where Jesus was. And the Bible says, said when they got in his presence that they offered him gold and they fell down at his feet. Why in the world would they give Jesus gold? Because scripture records in Daniel chapter 2 that gold symbolizes a king. When they gave baby Jesus gold, they said, we understand who you are. We understand that you're not just a little infant baby, but we understand that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, and we are here to worship you. The Bible says they gave him frankincense. What in the world is a newborn baby going to do with frankincense? If you study frankincense, you'll understand that it represents... God's sinless nature, his sinless deity. Leviticus chapter 5 in the law of Moses, the law said that no frankincense was allowed to be applied to the sin offering. It could be applied to every other offering, the burnt offering, the peace offering, the grain offering, but frankincense was not allowed to be put on the sin offering because frankincense represented no sin. When they gave him that frankincense, they, they said, we understand that not only are you king of kings and lord of lords, but you are the perfect lamb. You are without sin. You are spotless. Do you understand that their worship had purpose? Their worship had meaning. When they traveled 3,000 miles from Indy, India to Bethlehem, they didn't just walk into the presence of God and do patty cake. Their worship had meaning. The Bible says that they gave him myrrh. Why would they give Jesus myrrh? Because it represented his sacrificial death. John chapter 19 tells us that myrrh was used to anoint dead bodies for burial. Myrrh represented the death that he would die. What's my point? Why am I talking about the wise men? I'm saying that when I worship God, I don't want to worship him out of tradition. I don't want to worship him out of religion because I'm a Christian and that's what I'm supposed to do. But when I come in here on Sunday morning, I want my worship to have purpose. I want my worship to mean something to God. I want my worship to stand for something. I don't want to spend every week of my life giving my job the best I have to offer, giving my family the best I have to offer, and then come in here on Sunday and give God my leftovers. No, I want to give him the best I have all the time. And I want my worship to be meaningful. I want my worship to be acceptable and pleasing to Him. When I worship Him, I want Him to smile. When I worship Him, I want I want to get a little closer to Him and Him a little closer to me. Worship is about so much more than a song, a beat on the drums. So much more than music. Primary reason for worship, watch this, is to minister to the Lord. This is the posture of worship. Lord, I will bless you, not Lord, bless me. How many times, how many times I'm asking, I'm not being mean, I'm asking, how many times do we come in here with that approach? I will bless the Lord. If I don't get anything in return, it's not, Lord, bless me. I will bless the Lord. That's it and that's all. I will bless the Lord. Holy is his name. He is mighty. He is worthy. He is awesome. He is Savior. I will bless the Lord. Don't you think God would enjoy that mentality every once in a while? I will bless the Lord. I don't know who's here today. 
Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you're down. But I don't have a poor you, pitiful you message this morning. I have a message that says praise and worship can bring you out of your situation and you can move into a better life if you'll just learn how to worship him and learn that God loves worship. Purpose of worship. I really don't try to be like T.D. Jakes when I'm wiping my sweat here. I can't do anything without sweating. I'm soaked already. We left church last Sunday morning. I told Danielle I'm soaked head to toe. I went out to work on the house. I think it was yesterday, day before yesterday. I was. I went out there and I took a screwdriver and I installed a light cover and sweat was falling off my face. I can't do anything without sweating. I'm sorry if that grosses you out. But the purpose of worship is to lift the attention off of us. Get it on God. Take the spotlight off of us and get it on God. Worship is so powerful. Watch this. It's so powerful. The Bible says there was a filthy woman in sin. She spent a year saving her money. One year's wages, the Bible says. And she brought this alabaster box before God. And she fell at his feet. She began to pour that perfume on the feet of Jesus. Nowhere do we find that she prayed to him. Nowhere does scripture record that she said, Jesus, I am a sinner, please forgive me. All that we find is she fell down and she worshiped him there. And the Bible says Jesus looked at her and said, your sins are no more. They are erased. They are gone because worship it attracts it attracts the salvation of God it attracts the forgiveness of God it attracts the restoration power of God. It attracts the healing power of God. I'm telling you that you can get into such a worship zone that you can be sick in your body and you don't have to ask God to heal you, but he'll heal you because of your worship. There is power in your worship. The Bible says there come a day when Jehoshaphat and Israel were at war. I love this. The Bible says that they were outnumbered by the Moabites and the Ammonites. Scripture said, check this out. This is so awesome. If, you don't, if it doesn't bless you, just pretend like it does, okay, because it really blessed me. The Bible said that Jehoshaphat, this is what Scripture said, he inquired of the Lord. He didn't know what to do. God, we're outnumbered. Mathematically, there's no way we can win this fight. God, what do I do? You know what God's answer was? Just worship. I want you to put the, the praise team on the front line and send them out onto the battlefield and let them sing and worship. And the Bible says as they went out onto the battlefield, they were singing a song, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Can you imagine this? There's probably... Uh, arrows flying at their head. Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. And the Bible says as they worship God, that God and his army, his angels, they, they smite the Ammonites, they smite the Moabites. Scripture records that not one person in Jehoshaphat's army had to draw their sword or pull a bow and arrow, but that God destroyed the enemy. Why? Because of this thing called worship. I'm telling you, we under emphasize worship too much in the church. Worship has the power to set you free. Oh, let's take a praise break right there. Come on. Let's worship him in this house. He loves it. He's smiling right now. He loves your worship. To worship you, Lord Jesus. We can't do it enough. We can't do it enough. It's powerful. The Bible says that David, I just will keep pulling out these Bible stories, but sometimes it's just best to let the Bible preach itself. You know what I'm saying? The Bible says that Saul is vexed 
oppressed by the devil. He's out of his mind. He's not acting like himself. He's acting like a crazy man. The devil had him vexed. His people didn't know what to do. We can't talk any sense into him. We don't know what's going on. David said, I know what to do. I'll worship for a little while. He walks in there. He carries his heart. He just begins to play and worship. David didn't walk in there to a man that was oppressed by the devil and acting crazy. I don't know what he was doing. I don't know what the manifestation, the symptoms were. I don't know if he was scratching the walls and growling at people. I don't know what's going on. But I know that David didn't walk in there and, and kick him and hold him down like some Pentecostals would do. Ah, in Jesus' name and throw oil on him and spit on him. No, David knew all I got to do is worship. If I get the presence of the Lord in this place, it'll set Saul free. Oh, all I got to do is worship. Here I am to worship. Maybe that's what David's saying. I don't know what David's saying, but I know he began to sing. And as he began to worship God, the devil vacated the premises. Because worship has the power to drive demons away. Worship causes the devil to vacate the premises. And we need to start filling our cars, filling our homes, filling the church, filling our jobs, filling our schools with this thing called worship. We need to understand that there are things God will do for us if we become worshipers. There are situations that God will get us out of if we'll become worshipers. Worship. If it were possible for God to have a weakness, I think it would be for worship. He loves a worshiper. He records in Scripture that he seeks and he searches. Have you ever went seeking or searching for something? He searches for a worshiper. I think half of the things that that we call Worship in church or not worship. Because if real worship hits the church in full force, I believe there'll come a moment where musicians can't play. Singers can't even sing. Ushers can't usher. Media team can't run the sound and the screens. Why? Because we're in an atmosphere. We're in awe of his presence. We're in an atmosphere of worship. When real Holy Ghost worship sweeps over a church, It's not just an outward show. It's not just an outward display, but it's something that comes deep from my inward parts, deep from my soul, out of my belly, and I don't have to fake it on the outside. When real worship hits this place, we're not so easily distracted by the slightest little thing. Well, somebody walked out, they had to go to the bathroom takes our attention off of God for 10 minutes. Who cares? Worship. Bring your mind in here. Get your mind on Jesus, as the song says. Let's have church. One of the most self-contradicting phrases I've ever heard is boring worship. Church is boring. In various surveys, many people who were asked Why do you not attend church on a regular basis? Why do you not come to church? One of the most often responses was this, it's just boring. Church is too boring. These people are in the wrong church. True worship is anything but boring. The very essence of what worship is, it does not allow us to be bored. When we think about God, when we think about who he is, when we think about what he's done in our life, we can't help. Our hearts cannot help but swell up in adoration. God is our hero, and when worship is real, nothing about it is boring. And I believe that sometimes we... We underemphasize worship too much because we don't understand that as the saints of God, when we begin to worship him, something begins to happen in the heart of, of a sinner man. Worship and evangelism go together. Did you know that? Worship and the healing power of God go hand in hand. You need to understand that. Let me, let me prove my point real quick. Go to a church that has boring, dry, 
dead, cold worship, and this is what you'll find. Nobody's getting saved. Nobody's getting healed. Nothing's happening at that church because worship and evangelism go hand in hand. Go to a church that has anointed worship, powerful worship, and you'll always see somebody being saved, somebody being healed, testimonies here and there because worship and healing, worship and salvation, worship and evangelism, they're kindred. They go together. They are, in fact, connected. And we need to understand this morning that the power of our worship is our greatest evangelist. The power of our worship is sometimes our greatest witness. And there is a spirit of praise. There is a spirit of worship that needs to be rekindled every once in a while in our life. I'm not here to attack anyone. I'm not here to tell you this morning that Y'all are all sorry worshipers, and you need to learn how to worship God better. No, I'm here to challenge you. I'm here to motivate you that, yeah, we do a great job of worshiping, but we can do better. We can get closer. We can serve God with, with greater intensity, with greater zeal and greater passion. Don't lose your praise. Don't lose your worship. The moment the devil takes your worship from you is the moment he's claimed victory over your life. Worship is a powerful thing causes demons to vacate the premises. Why do we worship? Why is it so important to worship God? I believe that one verse in the Bible answers this question. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9, just listen to me. I didn't give it to him for the screens. The Bible says, John said, whoever has been born of God does not sin. I want to say that one more time. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For God's seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Scripture tells us that the seed of God is on the inside of us. And when we worship God, as I've talked about so much, we are creating a certain atmosphere. And after an atmosphere has been a certain way for a certain period of time, it becomes a climate. And you know, there's certain moods and there's certain feelings in certain atmospheres. An atmosphere creates a feeling. There's some things you want to do in certain atmospheres that you don't want to do in other atmospheres. Does, does that make any sense? And so... There's, there's things that maybe people would want to do at the club that you don't want to do in, in church, if you understand what I'm saying. And so after an atmosphere has been a, a certain way for so long, it becomes a climate. And if the climate is wrong, the, after the atmosphere becomes a climate, the climate becomes a stronghold. And so if I was to take some ice and I was to pour it in a bowl and sit it on this stage this morning, the ice wouldn't survive long because the climate's not right. It would melt. And what happens is when people are living in sin, going to the club, going to the party, doing the things of the world, listening to music about sex and drugs and violence, when, when that kind of music is in your ears and on your iPod and all that other stuff, once you've been exposed to that atmosphere for so long, you know, I've preached it before, it becomes a climate and then it becomes a stronghold in your life that is very difficult and challenging for you to get free from. The reason so many people are bound by sin and we think, man, why can't they just get their life right? It's because they stayed in a climate too long and that climate became a stronghold and it's very difficult for them to get free. So the question is this, why do we worship God? Back to 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. The seed of God is on the inside of us and it cannot survive in the wrong climate. The seed cannot maintain in the wrong atmosphere. If you want the seed of God to grow 
If you want the seed of God to be exposed and become contagious, you have to get in the right atmosphere. And so that's why we come to church. That's why we praise and worship God. That's why we lift our hands and we lift our voices. People don't understand it. A lot of people think it's racket. They think it's noise. We're too emotional. Why is she crying? Why is she shouting? Oh, they're getting too carried away over there at Spirit and Truth Worship Center. But praise, worship is more than, oh, please understand understand this. It's more than music. It's more than noise. Praise and worship is spiritual warfare. You want to know what spiritual warfare looks like? It's worship. And if you could see in the spirit realm, there is a battle going on. Angels, demons, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Worship is not a time filler. We don't sing three songs on Sunday morning to take up time to to get to the preaching. It's not a time filler. It's not something that we do to just get to the preaching part of service as we worship God is stirring up the spirit world. It activates the spirit world. And as we worship God, remember, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. As we worship him, we are creating an atmosphere for God's glory to show up. And if we do it long enough, if we do it with the same level of zeal and the same level of energy and the same level of intensity in the high times and in the low times, in the bad times and in the good times, our worship will become a climate. And it will become contagious. It becomes a seed, and that seed begins to grow. And once the atmosphere is right, something begins to happen in the heart of a sinner. Have you ever been in that kind of church service where the praise and worship was so anointed and it was so powerful and and somebody brought a guest with them and they've never been in a Pentecostal church in their life but that worship got on them and they had to run to an altar and lift their hands and tears are flowing down their face. That's the power of worship. Something begins to happen in the heart of a sinner and they begin to feel our joy. They begin to feel our peace, our freedom. Something in them says, I don't have what they have, but I want it. I've got to have it. I'm almost finished, but when a church has a burden about people, you know that we're supposed to have a burden for other people? We're supposed to have a burden for the lost. When we have a burden for people, we can't just come in here on Sunday morning and be the frozen chosen. Your worship or lack thereof is affecting that person that's next to you. We need to understand that our worship is tied to evangelism. Everything we we do, we should have a burden to our comfort level. I don't, I don't like being around Christians that are comfortable. God doesn't want you to be relaxed. God doesn't want you to be comfortable. He wants you to have a burden. Anybody remember that, uh, a message? I know y'all forget them on a week-to-week basis, but anybody remember that message uh, in the old building? I had everybody put a bean in their shoe. Anybody remember that? How miserable that feeling is when you, when you get something in your shoe. It's, it's a burden. That's how God wants your spiritual walk to be, that, to that place where you're never comfortable, you're never satisfied, you're never relaxed, but you always have a burden, you always have a longing. For, you, you're always unsatisfied. We need to understand that we should have a burden to match our comfort level. We shouldn't just come to church and be unconcerned. The praise team shouldn't be unconcerned in our worship. There are people perhaps in this room that if, if they don't get saved, they'll go to a place called hell. I should have a burden about that. You should have a burden about that. You should not be comfortable about that. And we need to desire. I know it sounds crazy. It sounds like I'm contradicting myself, but we need to have a desire for a burden. 
Give me a burden. Give me a greater burden to worship you. Give me a greater burden for the lost. We need to desire to worship God. Jesus said, whatsoever you desire, believe, and it will happen. How many desire to be in the presence of God this morning? We ought to desire it. We ought to desire it more than we desire money. More than we desire pleasure. More than we desire anything else. I think sometimes we just need our desire back. God, just give us a unified spirit of desire where we're hungry for you, hungry for your word. We need to get into, oh, we need to get into the Bible where tears begin to fall off of our face and conviction begins to swell in our heart. And it's not, it's not a have to. I say this all the time. It's not a have to come to church Sunday. It's not a have to play the bass or the piano. It's not a have to sing on the praise team. It's I get to. It's ministry. I'm honoring God. I'm giving him my worship. I don't have to pray. I get to pray. I don't have to read the Bible. I get to read the Bible. God, give us our desire back. I was going to say musicians can come, but they're already up here. Praise God. I hope I'm making sense this morning. This is just what was on my heart today. The Bible says that Elisha the prophet died and he was buried. Think about this. He died and he was buried. And I don't know how long he'd been dead, but I know that it was long enough that, that the flesh was gone from his bones. His bones were lying in a pit. But anybody remember what Elisha's desire was? Double portion. I want, I want twice of the anointing that Elijah's got. And when he died, he died one miracle short. If you study it, he died one miracle short of the double portion. This is how detailed God is. The Bible says as his bones were laying in a pit, there was a war going on. There was a battle going on one day, and a fallen soldier fell in the pit on Elisha's bones. And when his body made contact with the bones, instantly he was raised from the dead. And at that point, Elisha became the man of the double portion because he had performed exactly twice as many miracles as the great Elijah did. They took him, and they threw his bones in a pit. But his desire, somebody said it like this one time, his desire lived on in his bones. Which says to me, if we desire to see revival bad enough, if we desire to see a move of God bad enough, if we desire to get into the presence bad enough, it will happen. If we desire to see an outpouring of God's spirit bad enough, if I desire to see my family saved, my children saved, even after I'm dead, my desire can live on in my bones and my children can be saved and my grandchildren can be saved. We need a desperation spirit. We need something that goes over and surpasses normal religion. I heard someone say one time that desperation always precedes demonstration. Every time, desperation goes before demonstration. In other words, when you get desperate enough, when you get to that place where you are desperate enough for a move of God, God will demonstrate himself one way or the other. So many churches are plagued with a climate of mildness, calmness, mellowness, tameness. Don't make no sense for a preacher like me to get up and sweat and scream at people and spit and all that other stuff. Absent from many congregations in America is that raw, that rare dissatisfaction, that rare desperation. But God is not impressed with patty cake Christians. God will not be moved by people who just flop down in a seat on a Sunday morning and don't want anything. They're not hungry for more of God. They're not thirsty for his presence. God says, I'm looking for a spirit of desperation and hunger. And I'm finished. You can stand with me all over the house this morning. Let's give God a praise.
shout of praise. Some musicians begin to play. I've used this analogy before, but as I close this morning, I'll use it again. The other night, we'd been working on the house, and several people, God bless them, were out there helping us. And and I uh, told Danielle, I said, "Won't you go pick up some some pizzas for everybody, and let's take a break and eat." And uh, Papa John's has these new things called uh, garlic knots. I don't know if any of y'all have had those, but they they got a lot of garlic in them, and they're very strong. And if you eat one, here's the thing about stuff like that. If you eat one, you don't have to tell anybody what you ate because they just know. They can can smell it on you. And I believe that God wants to get us to the place that when we leave here on Sunday morning, we go to the job tomorrow, we go to our schools tomorrow, we don't have to tell anybody where we've been, but they can see it on us. They can smell it on us. They know They've been in the presence of the Almighty God. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4 of Peter and John that the people took note of them, that they had been with the Lord. They had been in the presence of the Lord. The Bible says that when Moses came off of the mountain, his face was shining so bright they had to put a towel on his face because they couldn't look upon him. I want to get in that kind of service. I want to get in that kind of move of God that when I leave here, everyone knows where I've been. The devil knows. All of hell knows. My friends know. My enemies know. I've been in the presence of the Lord. That's all I've got this morning. I want to open up this altar for a few moments today. I just want to invite you to this front, this altar today, if you want to become a better worshiper. Maybe you're here and and you're saying, you know what? I want my worship to go to another level. I want to worship God with the same zeal, the same intensity in the good times and in the bad times. I don't want to come into church on Sunday morning and be a spectator. I want to get involved. I want to engage. I want to go after God like I've never went after Him before. I want to understand that as I worship Him, healing takes place. As I lift my hand and sing songs and praise Him, I can be restored in my body even this morning. Would you come? This praise team lifts up this song this morning. Let's just worship Him for a moment. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. You are worthy of all praise. You are worthy, God. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah. Come on. Lift your hands in this place. Let's fill this room for a moment with the aroma of worship. Let His glory fill this house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 